Episode number 158 Meg looked very like a rose herself, for all that was best and sweetest in heart and soul seemed to bloom into her face that day, making it fair and tender, with a charm more beautiful than beauty. Neither silk, lace, nor orange flowers would she have. I don't want a fashionable wedding, but only those about me whom I love, and to them I wish to look and be my familiar self. So she made her wedding gown herself, sewing into it the tender hopes and innocent romances of a girlish heart. Her sisters braided up her pretty hair, and the only ornaments she wore were the lilies of the valley, which, her John, liked best of all the flowers that grew. You do look just like our own dear Meg, only so very sweet and lovely that I should hug you if it wouldn't crumple your dress, cried Amy, surveying her with delight when all was done. Then I'm satisfied. But please hug and kiss me, everyone, and don't mind my dress. I want a great many crumples of this sort put into it today. And Meg opened her arms to her sisters, who clung about her with April faces for a minute, feeling that the new love had not changed the old. Now I'm going to tie John's cravat for him, and then to stay a few minutes with Father quietly in the study. And Meg ran down to perform these little ceremonies, and then to follow her mother wherever she went, conscious that in spite of the smiles and the motherly face, there was a secret sorrow hid in the motherly heart at the flight of the first bird from the nest. As the younger girls stand together, giving the last touches to their simple toilet, it may be a good time to tell of a few changes which three years have wrought in their appearance, for all are looking their best just now. Jo's angles are much softened, she has learned to carry herself with ease, if not grace. The curly crop has lengthened into a thick coil, more becoming to the small head atop of the tall figure. There is a fresh color in her brown cheeks, a soft shine in her eyes, and only gentle words fall from her sharp tongue today. Beth has grown slender, pale, and more quiet than ever. The beautiful, kind eyes are larger and in them lies an expression that saddens one, although it is not sad itself. It is the shadow of pain which touches the young face with such pathetic patience, but Beth seldom complains and always speaks hopefully of being better soon. Amy is with truth considered the flower of the family, for at sixteen she has the air and bearing of a full-grown woman, not beautiful, but possessed of that indescribable charm called grace. One saw it in the lines of her figure, the make and motion of her hands, the flow of her dress, the droop of her hair, unconscious yet harmonious, and as attractive to many as beauty itself. Amy's nose still afflicted her, for it never would grow aggression, so did her mouth, being too wide, and having a decided chin. These offending features gave character to her whole face, but she never could see it and consoled herself with her wonderfully fair complexion, keen blue eyes, and curls more golden and abundant than ever. All three wore suits of thin silver grey, their best guns for the summer, with blush roses in hair and bosom, and all three looked just what they were, fresh-faced, happy-hearted girls, pausing a moment in their busy lives to read with wistful eyes the sweetest chapter in the romance of womanhood.